Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you very much. Well, it is very nice to be here. I'm very honored to be able to stand up and speak in front of so many amazing people. I have got to listen the last few days to many different talks and um, from both academia as well as industry. And it's very fun to watch how that gets them all blended together. Um, the focus of getting the academia and the industry together actually is something that is kind of a great segue kind of going into kind of what we are, I'm going to talk about, which is AI and imaging and autonomous vehicles. Because about 10 years ago, this was something that we ran into. We were visiting some different computer vision conferences. We were visiting some academia as an industry partner and working very, you know, very diligently in computer vision algorithms and research. And we ran into this kind of interesting groups that started spawning, you know, one out of Europe, one out of the Eastern, you know, East Coast, another one out of Canada. These guys taking our GPUs, taking our processors, and using them for something that we hadn't thought of before. And so they were moving away from the traditional approach of taking images into artificial intelligence, particularly into CNNs. And so by the inter, you know, intermingling, talking, trying to figure out why the heck are these crazy college people buying our GPUs, and it wasn't for gaming, I will say that. We do that too, by the way. That's a different business, but I won't be talking about th that today. But why were they buying them, and what were they doing? And they're asking us all these weird questions. And by that engagement and that learning together, we started paving the way about a decade ago into AI. And so we saw that shift from computer vision into AI very quickly. I think Alex. Krzyzewski, I don't make sure I pronounce that well, is um, first within his AlexNet in the uh, ImageNet conference was one thing that really turned a corner that we recognized into a lot of researchers. Up until then, um, a lot of computer vision scientists, algorithms, what, what, what were we doing? We're tuning cameras, we're tuning imagers, we were chasing edges, we were chasing features, we were looking at these little pixelated things, trying to make sure, is that a smile, is that an eye? And we're working through all of that and trying to do very good pattern recognition. And AI turned that on its head, and quickly with Alex's paper, he went, you know, kind of first introduced there, became much better, right? We were trying to push into the 80 percentages, percentage areas for, for quality, and Alex kind of jumped there. And then all of a sudden, all these other AI guys show up. And then within a couple of years, we saw this huge shift from the traditional approaches, which, by the way, we still use today in some cases, but into the AI era. And so I think this is a time that we're very excited about talking about that in terms of how does that start applying into automotive. But just giving a little bit of background, I think, first, is that part of the stuff that, that we saw with the AI shift was the ability of two things. One, a ton of data. I think we, you guys have all heard this before. One, a ton of data, and two, a ton of processing power so that you can actually go through that data and actually train stuff very quickly and get results very quickly. And one of the um, things that we've been happy because we kind of jumped into, here, uh, into the AI stuff first is that we got to see this get productized first in data centers. We got to see this product first in other commercial applications. And then we get to see that same thing a few years later show up into other industries such as robotics and to automotive and even into healthcare. So we're seeing all of this stuff that we're doing within the AI area migrate across being powered by faster processors, being powered by more data, and we'll talk a little bit about both of, both of those things, and being applied into a, bun a bunch of different areas as well. And I think the best way to kind of think through this is, is thinking about all the amazing things that we've seen in AI probably over the last four, five, six years. We've seen AI win it go. Not imaging, but kind of a different cool application. Um, for the gamers in here, we've seen it play Doom reasonably well. We've seen it learn to paint by taking a picture and taking a style from a common artist and applying it to that picture. 
We've seen AI do a lot of stuff with your voice. Some of it very encouraging, some of it slightly disturbing, depending on your accent and how you talk to the phone. I curse at my voice AI quite a bit. Um, my accent, I don't know what it is, does not cooperate with the AI. Um, we've seen it um, learn context, writing captions for pictures or videos, being able to understand that there's a dog and there's another dog and one's lying down or sitting next to the other dog on a beach. We've seen robots learn motor skills, articulating objects, placing them together. We've seen them learn to walk. We've seen them drive. And so some of the other fun applications that we've seen AI do that, it, you know, from an imaging standpoint is take old photographs, old pictures, and add information to them. Whether it's super real time, adding frames between them, and, and being able to take something that was maybe caught in 15 frames per second and add a lot of frames, or something that was black and white, and then adding color to it. Something where we take a live real time and take something down to pixel accuracy and being able to take a video and segment down the pixel of where's cars, where's roads, where's different objects in them. And then my personal favorite, hair. Wait for it. Okay, come on, you got it. There's a joke there, okay. But colorizing hair, real time, being able to look, you know, this is my fantasy right here. Color my hair, you know, dot, toss it around. You know, do I look better blonde, red, brunette? Um, but, but these are real things that they're trying out in retail. Clothing, hair color, all these different things that AI can make feel real to you and helps drive even purchasing decisions in, in, in these types of very cool applications. So we see AI adapting to all of this. And the reason I like talking about some of these other applications and showing these two engineers, two researchers, is you guys will find unique ways that we've not even thought of yet how to apply this to different applications, different industries, and some of it even into self-driving cars with the imaging. Uh, one of the things that we like playing with is, is taking a simple, simple board and drawing on it. I wish I had this in eighth grade. I failed art. This would have been nice. I could draw this. I couldn't draw that. Um, but, but the very easy idea is with just simple things. You can tell the AI add rocks, add water, add a mountain, add trees. Um, and all it does is take images, and then we'll map them into certain, certain areas. And this is a very simple application to create different things. We take forests and say, I want that to be rock now. And so you can apply that and get a much better, much better view. Or you can say, how about a waterfall, please? And just by adding water, the AI knows that in this direction, it's a waterfall, not a surface of a pool. And we can apply these to create synthetic worlds. We can apply these to create test cases for autonomous vehicles. We can apply these to do a lot of very cool different things besides passing eighth grade art, which would have been good for me. Um, with that, in terms, of, in terms of what we're looking at, AI has continued to evolve. evolve. Um, convolution networks were kind of where we started. Um, we moved past that. We're in recurrent networks. We're in GANs. We're looking at re different types of reinforcement learning. Then there's a whole machine learning segment that's completely different than that, that's doing a bunch of different things. And then there's hybrids of these networks that are coming together. Um, one of the key investors out of Sequoia, I was at a conference last year with the Department of Energy, and, and he made the observation is, is we have now taken to production everything we knew in the 60s. And so, but we're seeing on the early side with a lot of the places that Sequoia invests in, the next generation. So hopefully we can relearn what we knew in the 70s and 80s, apply that, and then new researchers are actually learning all kinds of fun, new crazy stuff that I get to get exposed to. Point being is AI as we know it and have experienced kind of over the past five, six years is just starting with data, with these amazing computers and these processors even as small as something that can go into your phone, your thermostat, your car. We can move things out of the data center type world into application all around us. And some of these networks allow us to do that in a lot of various ways, or they allow us to do our job easier. 
So we can use some of these networks just in terms of improving our efficiency in terms of what's important data. And I'll talk about that. Um, and data size is growing. I think Katie said it right yesterday. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about this later, but I will reiterate that FedEx is the new king of bandwidth. So if you didn't catch that yesterday, she said planes, and she's absolutely right. Is, is wires no longer fast enough? I never thought in my career I would go from sneaker net being the fastest back to sneaker net being the fastest. Right, I don't know if that means I'm old or we just have been advancing way too fast. But zettabytes are being generated. It's amazing what's coming. AI research growing, whether I look at NeuroIPS or the CV CVPR, we're just seeing AI papers continuing to grow. And we also we're seeing model complexity growing quite a bit. So just to focus on that a little bit, and sorry, I'm gonna change because I'm NVIDIA, so I wanna use the green one. Um, but we're seeing these you know, petaflop day training, just this increase over time. And all of this out here, a lot of this BERT and uh, GP2, this is just speech. I'm not even talking imaging yet. So the imaging guys had the, you know, we had some speech and some other stuff, and we had some imaging stuff, then we had, you know, it's going back and forth, and then we had kind of some more good ResNet and GoogleNet and some BGG stuff, and then the speech guys are going crazy. And so I use this slide not as only a encouragement to see where, how much processing we're using, but for us, kind of people of, of, of this persuasion that like images and like pictures, don't let the voice guys, man, beat us. Come on. We need to be that next, that next stage. And hardware is coming that will allow us to get there. So, so I'm just going to encourage everybody. I, I present this, and I realize this is just speech. I'm at the imaging conference. I was embarrassed. I was looking at this. Come on, guys, we can do better. OK, so having, having said that, let me talk a little bit about um, um, how we look at self-driving cars. So kind of the background, I think, is important to understand in terms of AI. Now let's apply that into the vehicles and some of these techniques. First, you have to develop AI. Then you have to run it, drive it. it starts with lots of data. The data does training. Then we do a lot of testing. Once we kind of are comfortable with that, we do a model. We pass that over to running it. And then we go through a development operation cycle of going back into this nice loop. The model goes over and gets deployed. Sensors come in. We perceive. Is it a bike? Is it a person? Is it a car? That will matter later. Then we reason about what we see. We start predicting. People are great and very random in terms of their motion and prediction, but they're also very slow don't have a large inertia, which means I can apply physics. So a person, especially small people under three years old, do random things and will show up on streets where you least expect them. Bigger people do less random things. Dump trucks going 100 kilometers an hour typically go in the motion they're driving. These things are important as we reason out our scene. They drive our actuators and our planning, and then stuff when we ever see something that we didn't expect, we apply it back here, a loop, deploy a loop, and going through these two continuous loops for development. In terms of our systems, we have this become something that we put in a data center, and a lot of this is done both in the data center and as well in the vehicle. And so we create these brains, and they're software compatible. One of the biggest things that I see in terms of autonomous vehicles, although I love talking about imaging, I love talking about cars, I love talking about hardware, I'm a hardware guy, but this is, I hate saying it, this is a software problem. It really is. It is the grand challenge of software problems. The amount of complexity in terms of image technology, prediction, real-time OS, real-time operation, Safety, security. It feels like the biggest data center you have thought of, plus all the worst of embedded altogether in terms of a controlled loop feedback system or open loop, loop if you have the right algorithms. But it's just interesting. This is a huge software problem. And, it, and it's growing very quickly. So being able to keep your software stable, changing hardware underneath it, changing image sensors underneath it, 
is very critical, and image characteristics, and, I, and I'll talk a little, and, that, and that's mostly what I would like to kind of talk about. Why auto? Um, there's a lot of money. That's one of the reasons. Uh, the commercialization of AI in data centers and a lot of other places is happening. There's a lot of money too. But this kind of funds the industry. But how it gets deployed, besides just the money, I think the important thing to think about is each of these use cases, operational design domains, geographies, or whatever you want to refer to it as, are different. So although I talked about a single software base, now I need to be able to take it in different applications, whether it's on the car, through some level two autonomy, potentially, whether it's in a robo-taxi, level four type autonomy, whether it's on a truck, again, level four, hub to hub, or within a geofence distribution center, or it's on a campus somewhere, lower speed, shuttles, access vans, these types of things. All of these have different requirements, some of the base fundamental stuff for imaging, some of the base fundamental stuff for processing, but applications and how I take this out into the industry. It's very different for each of these, and you have to keep that in mind as you go, um, as you go forward. But if you do that, you get quite a bit of um, application on that. And if you've seen us, we're involved with various things on trucking, in terms of software and hardware, we're involved um, quite a bit in the robotaxi space and also in passenger car space. So, we, so we've been gaining a lot of knowledge. And one of the things that we've done is we've not just developed kind of the pipeline, but we've um, in terms of helping people, but we're actually driving our own technology and developing our own software stack. The best way to learn about your pain is to do it ourselves. And hopefully, if we learn a little bit ahead of you guys, we can figure out how to smooth over some of the stuff. Or if you guys tell us your pain points, we'll help solve this. And so a lot of the technology that you see coming out of a, hopefully, industry company is as we learn and solve things, we get to provide that to you, accelerate what you're doing, allow you to operate faster. Whether it's perception, finding all the objects, finding the key landmarks, mapping it to an HD map, whether it's reasoning or creating your own map. Cars can create their own maps, no reason why not to. Or it's driving, again, which can be unconventional or as well on an AI system. And the reason a lot of this is important is I've sat through a few talks and people say, oh, this is hard, oh, this is hard, oh, this is hard. And you're right, it's all hard, but there actually is techniques and stuff that we've seen where conventional techniques and artificial intelligence in a ensemble, if you will, of redundant, diverse networks and algorithms actually can provide extremely safe and deterministic operation for autonomous vehicles. A lot of the technology, surprisingly, is there. Regulations, not so much, and that's still being worked. And the social aspect, also still being worked, as, other, as others have commented on. OK, so let's jump into a few other things. Imaging and the AI. First of all, it's inside the car, it's outside the car. It's about autonomy, it's about being safe, it's about being convenient to drivers. So outside the car, objects, free space, typical thing, as you approach your car, knowing it's you, being convenient, opening your door, opening your trunk, letting you know that you're being approached by an aggressive uh, bicyclist, and by the way, most cyclists, I love you, but there's 5% of you out there that drive me nuts. So if you're a bicyclist, I think, I think you've seen that too. It gives you all you guys a bad name. But, um, but the, you know, this is important. Make sure you don't hit the bicyclist. Make sure you don't uh, um, have issues um, this way. And, and I've had direct exposure to this. I almost, in Taiwan, you know how the scooters go between cars? Have you ever been to Taiwan? You pull up to an intersection, then all the scooters come weaving in weaving in between all the cars to get up to the front of the crosswalk where they can go first. Um, I learned very quickly that you should not open your door during that time frame. I was in a taxi and I could see where I wanted to go and I said, this is good. And he's like, okay. And so I opened the door and almost took out a, a very nice gentleman and his dog. The gentleman didn't look so bad at me, but the dog gave me the dirtiest look you can imagine. 
the dog even knew I was wrong. So um, this would have been helpful. So autonomous in terms of outside the car. Inside the car, you know, passenger recognition, drowsiness, being distracted. Um, other types of even medical applications that we're doing now is, is, is that um, with imaging devices, we actually have a very good idea of your oxygen level of your skin, for example. We can tell what your heartbeat is. So there's medical applications actually even with imaging devices in these smart cockpits that many of you or the industry is actually pioneering and AI is being used in these places. So going back to the big pain points in autonomous vehicles, a lot of data. 1.6 petabytes per day. FedEx loves me. Seagate loves me. I don't love me. The amount of money I spend on Seagate drives, anyway, um, let's not go there. Um, this is a lot of money, and, and you're FedExing it back and forth for your vehicles as your test fleet's being driving, you know, driving around the world to collect not just information for training, but information and sequences for validation. Sometimes your training set of the information you're grabbing is smaller than, you know, smaller than your validation set, and that's very important. Curation, you have billions of frames. Now what are you gonna do with them? Most of the information is redundant, not useful. And so we have AIs picking out interesting things and saying these are frames that maybe we should add to our data set. We pick up hotspots. So the AI actually first data for you, and then we have a professional trainer. We have. Um, thousands of them that work, and, and they pick out these good frames. You know, things like dump, tr you know, cement truck, interesting. You know, bicycle in front of monument, interesting, right? So it picks interesting things out that you need to either improve your network or validation points. So that is assistant, and you know, 10% of that is useful. Then that goes into um, a labeling. Uh, we currently have 50 different labeling projects within the company just for autonomous vehicles. So it's not just labeling one way, you're actually labeling for 50 different types of AI use. In the cockpit, out of the cockpit, a lot of different things that you, would, that you want to see. And then that goes through, if, you, you know, if you're taking it through a safety process, it's traceable, it's QA'd, it's, all those things still have to be done. So this is, um, with an auto, it's not just sometimes like the production stuff does on the commercial side. I label it, eh, it's pretty good. Okay, keep going. My network is pretty good, it's okay. An automotive, not good enough. You have to be superhuman in terms of your perception. So labeling matters quite a bit. And so we have a very professional team that takes care of that. You train it, uh, you have different you know, um, AI teams working at each of your AI networks. You, you know, this is at a data center level. You take some of the image and you run it through what we call replay. So rather than, and that's your, part of your validation set. So part of the images and the video feeds that you get through, you just are replaying it to your different sensor systems. And this will become important in just a second. I'll explain it because we're capturing this data pre-ISP. Very important to capture it raw. Well, if I capture it pre-ISP, guess what? I can do all kinds of fun things with it later. It's very then usable long term. And so we, we test this data, and then finally we'll take some of it and we actually run full simulations of that that I'll talk a little bit about. Uh, future cars, as I said, very software defined, whether it's AI, computer vision, augmented reality, high performance computing, assisting, augmenting, autonomous, and there are other sensors besides cameras actually in this vehicle, radars and lidars particularly that give us um, redundancy and diversity across sometimes both perception and distance and a few other types of um, key information that you would like to have and to prove it against. So again, software defining, collecting the data, training data, simulating data, these are different systems that you actually have and workflows across AV and what we call our IX for our cockpit end-to-end, -end, open platform, and then this is the pre-trained models. One thing that we um, talked about, because we've been working on this for a while and we feel that they're pretty good now, is, is opening up all of our pre-trained models. We talked about that last December in China, and so those models will become available soon so that people can take them and do other things with them. Right? We think AI should be uh, you know, available because although I, 
I may do something very important on a certain use case, like I showed you those four use cases, and there's many more that fall out of that for, auto, um, for automotive, you may have a different use case. So what I'm doing may not be what you need, and so you can actually take those models and take them even further. And these are some of the networks that we're talking about. Obstacles, are very clear, distance. Um, it, it's amazing how good we are as people at telling kind of the rough distance with our eyes, and we can train with good ground truth because we have good LIDARs. We can train actually the cameras to do a pretty good job at estimating, different, at estimating distances um, by looking at the size of vehicles ahead of you, kind of telling how far their wheels are so we have a pretty good distance. Time to collision, easy, uh, free space. Um, both These are things that you don't want to drive on, cars, people. Free space is where you do want to drive, so you kind of you have kind of both sections of that. Uh, structure for motion is very important. LIDAR, paths, paths, both uh, computer vision techniques, conventional te techniques, as well as AI techniques. Why are AI techniques so important? There are times you have no lanes. There are times the road edge goes away. Call it snow, call it whatever. Now, I will say, if you put a car out on a completely white piece of uh, thing that goes 100 yards every which way and expect it to drive, well, a person will have a hard time there as well. So, you know, there are some things that, that we have to take in terms um, of terms of practicality. Although, given a GPS location, the car may say, well, given lack of anything, everything looks safe, I'm just going to go from point A to point B. That seems the, be the best path to go, which is kind of what a human would do if you're out like an assault flat out in Utah. Um, however, with what's interesting with the path and the AI is we pick up a lot of clues as humans of where to go that are not lanes. For instance, follow the car in front of you. Seems logical. If they're going to die, they'll die first. So you can stop. I'm just teasing. Um, but, but, but we follow cars in front of us commonly. We'll see road marks on lanes that are just the tire markings. We'll follow those. Right, there's a lot of the hints that are, pat, you know, that are not mapped or not lane lines that we normally as humans will follow. We train AIs to do the same thing. Signs, obvious, um, um, map in terms of all the different fi fixtures, high beams, understanding the high beams and the context of high beams. Um, when to turn mine off, when to turn mine on. Very important, is the person in a curve, is it not in a curve? Right, all these things we can do it conventionally or we can add some AI cool techniques to it and actually get a much better high beam use case or, or, or usage model that gets you much more effectiveness. You know, parking, camera blindness, I can tell if my camera is not working. Do I have a dot on it? Am I okay? Do I have a large bug on it? If I'm in Texas and they have those seven inch grasshoppers, that tells you that camera is not viable anymore. Clean it or, or turn on your water sprayer or move to the next one. So you, have a, you can have a degraded operation until you can clean that. Intersections, traffic lights, gesture poses. A lot of times we have interaction of humans in the space where we drive. They point to us where to go. And so these poses, and, and I've seen a few uh, papers on this already this week as well, on posing and pointing and, and, and following that. Again, in the cabin, gaze detection, uh, drowsiness, predictions in, in terms of who does what. Let me go to the more interesting stuff. So in terms of the open models, you get a pre-trained model, very important. Start somewhere that looks good, has good uh, key performance indicators, so good KPIs. Uh, there's a transfer learning tool. You can retrain that with customer data. So somebody, or you can take data, you can reapply that, and you have a transfer learning tool. And I have a little bit more details where I, come, um, I break this down a little bit more. Um, then you end up with a customer trained model. So it's more specific to either use case or some of the parameters that you care about. Then you do it again for pruning and retraining. Then you can deploy it. And then you can take it all the way out to the car. So it lets you take a model, augment it with your own data, do transfer learning, and kind of go from there. Taking one more click down. And just to give you some common problems, I start with a module. This is a good module. I like it. I drive on it for two years. Unfortunately, my friends at On or Sony or Omnivision make a new camera. Dang it, two megapixel isn't sexy anymore. I need eight or more. So I get a new module. Kind of looks the same, it's black. A lot of other things though are different in it. I got more pixels, right? So, so transfer learning also will help, help with some of these things. And then, this is really good, and, and so my AI networks is pretty good, right? So I have a new lens, the coding's a little bit different, the sensor's a little bit different. 
the mechanicals are a little bit different. And then my good friends at the tier ones say, well, that's not good. And now we need to industrialize it. Dang it, it changed again. Small things, but these are important things as we go through the process of development from maybe your early favorite to your second favorite to your spouse. <laughs> Sorry, never mind. That's okay. This is the engineering conference. I got to go through that. Um, so, so, so base config data says what you start with. Um, and the early part of this, what we've learned a lot of times, and I've seen several talks actually the last two days, is the ISP or algorithmic things can get us a long ways to get, you know, to get target camera samples, a base configuration. You can do the calculations of it and get a very good, easy, just algorithmically transformed data set. So taking known things against base config, get the deltas, transform the whole data set over. Number one, just algorithmic. Then taking some of that same thing, I can retrain the DNN. I get initial one, then I can do more working on it, continue to, to optimize my target data set, more transfer learning, get the final DNN. Walking through that, so as I make changes in my optical system, my optics, my camera, my favorite tier one, whatever that may be, you have a path there to keep your software stable, your hardware stable, and just kind of walk through that in terms of changing camera type, camera position. Then there's the next problem that we have in the industry, um, which is in some regions, data cannot be exported. We know this. Um, China does not like sending out a lot of data on certain types of things. Confuses me a lot because if you're in China and you're on your internet, man, the stuff you can find is, is amazing. But uh, they don't let it export, which is I'm, I'm confused about sometimes. But in terms of formal data, and, and so we have this new process where, again, you can create an AI network in North America, or you can create it maybe in Germany. I'll just pick two random locations. Um, and then you can take that network and then have local things, local companies, whether in either regions, also transfer, and then what you do is you actually send the model around, let everybody train it separately, and then you take the delta weights. So a lot of your AI networks have a lot of input, they have a structure, and then they have your delta weights through there. And then you can actually get the weights, give delta weights, go back, cycle through this, and it allows you to keep data in region, not violate any laws, keep ethical, keep moral, keep legal. Nobody goes to jail. And then, but you can actually train your model for any region that you need to. So this federated learning is something, was a problem that we actually came across in, in the medical industry. The medical industry has these laws, like HIPAA. And so I can't, unfortunately, if somebody takes a picture of my head, they can't share it with other people, which I'm kind of happy about. But, um, and, and if somebody takes a picture of your head, they can't share it with other people as well. But a doctor, if he's looking for an anomaly or a brain tumor, um, wants to refine that model across other, a bunch of different people, a bunch of different applications. And we found that medical, because of laws, had the same problem. So you could do hospital A, hospital B, hospital C. Very interesting. And so we realized that automotive has the same similar issue with regionalization of data. And so we're taking the same techniques with federated learning. It allows many companies, universities, whatever, to actually collaborate in a nice way and get a, and get a refined model. These are techniques that are very important to actually be able to get to production across multiple geographies. Um, I'm talking about a lot of high performance things, so I'm gonna put a little bit of plug here. Um, I'm not gonna show my competitor charts, but um, I, I will give them a, a thumbs up, is that um, as far as AI and processing going, a lot of companies, including NVIDIA, is creating more and more performant processors, and these processors are coming in a, a, a lot of good cost points and a lot of good performance points in terms of power and thermals. And so I'll talk about some of our bigger stuff as well, but um, you know, next generation, we, you know, we've had Xavier and Xavier Jetson that's been out for a while. That's been a very nice 30 tera op processor that many people uh, get to play with, that we play with a lot of ourselves. Um, next generation is Orin. We're going from 30 tera ops to int 8, almost 200 which would be less power and more cost effective as well. So, so both of those things are, are really cool. So remember that first chart where I showed you, the, showed you the lines? Yes, GPU computing is getting a lot more faster and cheaper and lower power. So it, it's very cool to see that. So all these cool networks and ideas and algorithms that you guys wanna come up with, don't be shy. 
processors are coming. We're on the early part of the curve for parallel processors in terms of architectural improvements, instruction set improvements, uh, caching improvements, memory architecture improvements. So those things are still being uh, um, folded in. And so we're on the fun part of the curve right now. So don't be shy on crazy, fun, new, exciting algorithms that, that you guys want to do. Um, we're talking, we're, you know, just in a few years, going from 30 tops to 200 tops. And if that's not enough, we will have a small box that will fit in the trunk of your car that will do two peta ops, about 750 watts. It's a little bit bigger than a laptop. So um, car computers are probably within a, what, what I think that's 2009 supercomputer type perf. Before we were like two decades behind, now we're only a decade behind of what we can put in the trunk of your car. So pretty amazing, um, um, to, pretty amazing performance coming. So we, we love algorithms, we love AI algorithms, imaging, lots of data, bigger pixels, more pixels, bring it. Remember that first curve where I said I felt bad? My, part of this is a pep talk to this team, it's like more pixels, more processing, don't worry the processing, bring the pixels. Let's do some cool stuff. And when it all gets, into, get, gets done, this is kind of what it starts looking like. And so you end up with a nice surround view. You have objects all labeled, you have objects identified, you have bounding box, 3D bounding box around each object, so you know the front of the car, the back of the car. Um, they get tracked across all the cameras. Um, so to some degree, we actually predict lane lines behind us. It actually helps to triangulate. So lane lines in front of you are very important, but lane lines behind you actually help localize a little bit better. And, and so these, these are very important things that, that we look at. Um, now, I have a car, it drives, it senses, it sees. And now I need billions of miles, people keep telling me. So how do I do that? And we actually agree with that. We actually want to get these cars tested out. Um, I've seen various talks in simulations and mapping, correlating between simulations. So a fleet of 20 cars is only do a million miles a year. Hard to get a billion miles quickly. And heck, what happens if I have to do a software update six months into it? Dang it, that's hard. Okay, so we need another method. And, and so we actually, um, early on in our program, we started doing simulators, we tried to get engaged with simulator companies, and, and we realized that we needed to help there. And so we actually created what we call um, a, a high-end simulator, where we have a big computer that has lots of GPUs that does all the modeling, the rendering, and what have you, and then it drives a ECU and a second computer, and we have all the I.O. adaptation to a second ECU so that this ECU thinks it's in a car. It doesn't know any better. It sees GMSL signals, it sees CAN messages, it actuates, it drives, and it, and it feeds back into the simulator. So that allows us to create environments that we can do a lot of different things with the simulation. And so just to go through this pretty quickly, Again, kind of the same thing. The two different computers driving on the road, um, driving across all the different sensors, driving in different um, conditions. Let's let this play a little bit. We can create different environments. We take in an open map interface, everything. You know, we're seeing this across a lot of the simulation companies, so this is very encouraging to us. Um, open map and a few other formats with different metadata, although it's like every company I talk to has their different metadata that they want to add on top of it, which is okay. We, you know, we can map to that, drop in map, drop in environmental detail, decide kind of what type of tree you want, where you want them, Whoop. a mouse click away, walls, cones, plot this down, throw this into your simulator, if you're in California, you add this. <laughs> you guys have been on the road here, it's just crazy. Um, you can move your sensors around. Since we have this as our test rig, we can put them in there, we can move them around, we can run different simulations, and these are physically modeled. Uh, so, they have, so they have that kind of component as well. We can run different traffic scenarios within the simulator. We can, either, we, we can either take third party, a lot of this is all third party driven, or you can author your own. Drop cars down, drop scenarios down, drop speeds, play, off you go, make sure that your autonomous vehicle kind of does the right thing, and then you run it real time. Make sure that the actual box in the car actually also does the real thing, brakes, merges, and then guess what, change the time of day. You want it rainy, you want it sunny, you want it nighttime, a little bit more mist in there. 
creates a lot of different scenarios. And this is very important as we author scenarios. I think as most of us engineers know, we can create one scenario, then we can create variances. How fast is the vehicle? How many vehicles? What color are the vehicles? Do I want to do a cut in at two meters at 100 kilometers? Kind of aggressive. 10 kilometers, 30 kilometers, 50, you know, or do 50 kph, and then what is my cut ins? Do I want to cut in from the left, from the right? Do I want to cut in quickly or slowly? And so we can create one scenario, and then you can start sweeping or schmooing across the variations and actually cover a lot of very useful um, solutions very quickly in real time. And so that's one of the things that we really are focused on is to. Because when you drive, you get some interesting scenarios, but in simulation, I can create almost any scenario, even ones that I don't want to put my drivers with. So a lot of environment models, traffic models, vehicle models, sensor models, scenario models, all go into the simulator, and then the AV runs on the other side and doesn't even know that it's there. In terms of sensor models, one of the important thing is, is that we render. So we have a nice 16 pixel, you know, you know, 16 uh, float raw pixels that come through the system. It goes into the final codec out, and then we create sensor models. In the sensor models, what do we do with that? We try to adapt it to physical characteristics of the sensor. So I have a general abstracted one that I can drive anywhere, and then I can say, okay, this module, I know what the film is, I know what the lens is, I know kind of the variances that it might mechanically fit in there. I can start adding those to the model. I can start deciding the model to take randomly pixels out or pixel lines out. Run the, same sim, you know, run the same simulation every time and slowly either degrade or improve my sensor. Make sure that my system still operates within the correct parameters that I expect. Same thing that we do with cameras, we also do with LiDAR and radar. Um, we're actually using our ray tracing engine for LiDAR, which is pretty cool as well. Because radars, are, I'm sorry, LiDARs do a lot of rays that we can cast and, and beat off stuff, and we do the same type of engine there. So it's pretty cool technology that we can use some stuff and give those sensor APIs. So again, development in terms of ingesting, curating, labeling, and training your DNNs. Put it in a vehicle, validation. And one of the key things, I'll just mention correlation to real world. Every sensor, every model, you have to correlate to real world. And we have a team that actually that's what they do. We have a model, we have mathematics, awesome, good job. And then I get involved, my, my job is to kind of throw stones at it and say, well, let me see the real sensor characteristics. Let me see that curve on that, on the model. Does it work? Does it translate? Now let me change the luminance on that. Does it translate? Right, all those things are critical as, as you get to the billions of models. And the nice thing about this is I can just rack these cars up into a data center. I don't have to build large cars. I can just put all these vehicles into a nice big data center, and I can run my virtual test fleet billions of miles across a whole bunch of scenarios. I can build one and just say, you're the rain one, you're the night one, you're this one, you're this one, and I can just run a bunch of them across it. So this is very important as we look at it and model the sensor. And if I don't like the sensor location, the position, the manufacturer, the film, change it, rerun it again. Um, open platform in terms of a lot of the different um, sensors, as well as the simulation environments, whether it's coming from Cognetta, you know, getting you know, sensor models from on, getting sensors um, um, for a lot of the different suppliers out there. So I think it's very important. And when you all get it together, you can build kind of an, uh, um, I think some of you may have seen this one. This is kind of our, kind of our latest video where, where we go from our new building to our almost new building. It's not quite done yet. Um, LIDARs are not used in this. We use LIDARs for ground truth and for logging any issues that we see. We always like to have ground truth running within the system. This car has a couple computers in there. One's running the driving, one's running a cockpit computer. So they're sensing both in the cockpit as, around, as well as around the vehicle. It thinks it's in a carpool. So we've told the car it was in a carpool lane. So it took that lane. There's more than one person in there. So you can actually sense and jump in the carpool lane that way. This was um, in Chinese. Put your phone away, please. There was no profiling by the camera. That was just, we did that one in China, so it was easier. It didn't like sense and goes, well, what language might you speak? So, so there was none of that. We just have different languages that are, that are supported. This is real versus the simulator. So we actually modeled the whole course. 
and that way I can run thousands and thousands of time in my simulator before I ever go on the vehicle. This is a fun turn that my wife yells at me on. Um, anyway, in the autonomous vehicle, she can't yell at me. It's like, look, no hands. You know, it's, it's good. Um, and then we'll get to come back home, which is, this is a fun thing on San Tomas there. We have a very aggressive clover leaf. And this time we actually had a police officer. It's got to accelerate, slow down, then it sees a police officer, and it's, okay, it's not my lane, we're good, moving around them. So very complex scenarios that an autonomous vehicle can move through all autonomously by sensing its environment, predicting the environment, understanding it. All of this right now is 90% uh, of it is camera based. So these imagers are what we use. And so thank you very much. That is a little brief update on autonomous vehicles.